my name is Sharon Hecker. I am Deputy Chair of ICRA, and I am delighted to introduce our final panel today before the keynote address, which will continue to think about legacy from an artist's perspective um, through a conversation between the artist uh, Michael Craig Martin and our indefatigable board member, Edith Devaney, who uh, I'd like to give her a proper introduction. Um, she is also managing director of the David Hockney Foundation, and until recently was the long-term uh, contemporary curator and head of summer exhibitions at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. She's worked with many uh, international contemporary artists on both the curation um, of uh, this annual exhibition and special projects, as well as displays relating to it. Uh, Edith will be speaking with Michael Craig Martin, who hardly needs an introduction, uh, as he's a principal figure of British contemporary uh, conceptual art. Uh, his work is featured in many public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Tate London, the Salt of Pompidou, um, at the Reina Sofia, uh, and other museums. Uh, he was an artist uh, trustee of Tate from 1989 to 1999 and was elected to the Royal Academy in 2006. In 2016, he was knighted in the Queen's birthday honors for his service to uh, art. And um, I'm sure you'll be giving a more detailed um, introduction about his work. I just wanted to say that he is going to bring in um, two further themes that we haven't really discussed yet. One of them comes from his international background in the US and uh, the UK and Europe, as well as his teaching experience. And one of the questions we asked to speak about was also how you help promote legacy in the next generation of artists, which is something that um, will be addressed today. So here we are. Um, welcome. Hello. <laughs> uh, Michael, can I can I just dive straight in and just ask you just a, sort of very generally to, to start this off is that from your perspective as an artist, I mean, what does what does legacy mean to you and particularly in the kind of notion of catalog resonate? What do you what do you think of? when? Well, I have to say, um, oh, I remember thinking when I was uh, much younger that I was amazed that people, the, the idea that artists thought about what happened after they were gone. Because it seemed to me that being an, a living artist, you you live in your own moment and the, the, the moment you're in is the one that matters. You're the one you're, if you're not addressing the moment you're in, it seems to me you're wasting your time. And the idea that you, that an artist would be working for a moment that would only be perceived later seemed like a funny idea to me. And, but I have to say, as one gets older, one does think about these things in a different way. And, um, and I am aware of it. I'm, I'm also very struck by the whole idea of legacy, um, which in, its, in, in many ways has become a term that you hear much more often than you used to, because there's all these things about presidential legacy, you know, Donald Trump's legacy, mm -hmm. Boris Johnson's legacy. You know, I mean, I... The idea and and the idea that people do things in order to create a sense of legacy, and I don't ever remember before hearing people talk like that about legacy. That seems quite new, and I can't have to say I can't ever remember talking to any other artist about the idea of legacy. It's not something I think artists talk to each other about. I mean, that, that point that you raised, um, which was actually raised this morning by, by Nick Willing and, and uh, Ben Bowling, talking about Frank Bowling and, and Paul Arego and their parents, is that, you know, artists have to live in the moment. When you're creating, when you're, you're creating something, it's for now. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can think about. So I, I completely understand that difficulty of, of thinking, well, this is, I have to not only think about creating this now, for tomorrow's exhibition, but you know, in 50 years time, how are people going to perceive it? You, you can't possibly have all of those thoughts happening at the same time. No, I, but I, I, it's interesting that you had the, the children of artists speaking. I think it's really tough to be an artist child. And um, I do know uh, some artist children whose lives have almost been completely ruined by the death of the parent because the, res the sense of responsibility that they take on, uh, the sense that they owe it to their parent, that, and very often artists leave their, their circumstances in some chaotic state. 
which gives a great deal of effort for the people who, who try to look after their interests later on. And I think it's, a it's certainly a challenge to those who take on the, this responsibility. Um, and I'm very aware of it myself. I'm in my, my own way trying to organize my life a little bit so I don't leave it so in such a desperately confused state because I think it's going to be very difficult to manage. And and the point that you made as well about, you know, when, when an artist is in their 20s, they're not really thinking about legacy, but, you know, once you get to a, a certain stage, you might be. But, I mean, looking back on the the past decades of you, you've had a long career. You've been, you've been an artist. Forever. Forever. <laughs> and so looking back in those decades, presumably your, your kind of thinking towards legacy and, and the, the future beyond is, is, is something that has changed as each decade moves into the next. Well, and one's understanding of things changes, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm very aware that, um, uh, I've been fortunate in the last 25, 30 years that I've done a great deal of work. I became very, I was very conscious that in a certain sense, I'm a kind of, I was a kind of late starter in what I do and what I'm known for doing. And I had a bit of catching up to do. Somebody else who had found that voice in their work when they were in their 20s, by the time they're in their 70s, they have a long track record. I really only found it in my fifties, and so I've been. I was quite conscious that I. And and then one becomes aware when one's if when if one's fortunate enough that one's work goes into the world that the more work there is in the world, the better. And it's better. I'd much rather have it out there um, than in storage. Someplace um, I'm, I'm happy for it to be out in the world and i in a way it seems to me that that's maybe that's a very critical question in terms of legacy because i mean if you look at uh, two artists who produce a staggering amount of work one is picasso and the other is warhol well there's not an auction in the entire world that doesn't have works by picasso and warhol in them because there just is so much stuff out there there's so much work and rather than when rather than thinking that rarity gives value it's the, actually turns out i think it's the opposite it's it's actually the more work there is the more valuable things become because the things become reference points to each other when you buy a, a work of art by an artist, you're not just buying that work of art, you're buying your, the connection with that body of work that you know exists beyond the one you own. And so it, it seems, my, so I see these things quite differently than I would have done. It's, it's fascinating that whole thing about volume, isn't it? About, it, it and, yeah. it's, and, that, and that's where a catalog resume, of course, becomes very, becomes very important. Yeah. Um, because of the, the the possibility of there being a record as close as possible yeah. about what an artist has done. Um, some things, and I'm sure you've discussed this today, uh, are, are well recorded, easily recorded. And I myself have good records about some things and I have no records about other things. I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm the only person who's ever seen all my own exhibitions. <laughs> And um, and even I haven't seen all of them, if, if, if you include group exhibitions, because there are group exhibitions I've had work in, which I never saw. So nobody's ever seen all of them. But at least I've seen all the work. Of um, course. But... <laughs> But you know, one of the things that, and, and, and I, I don't know how interesting this is for, for an artist as well, but you know, one of the things that Anne Gallico was saying this morning when she was talking about Rachel Whiteread's um, catalogue resume, which is working on, is, is how useful it would have been for her curating the Rachel Whiteread retrospective had she been, had, had a catalogue resume been in existence, because you, what you can see is the span, but also the connections. And, and that's another thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, as an artist, would that be incredibly interesting for you to kind of look back at your own career and kind of see the work laid out like that? Yes, I see, I, I see my own work and I think other people perceive it as, as in quite different sections of work at, at different times. I'm, 
obviously aware of that, but the only thing I see is the continuity. I think, you know, I, I started doing what I did when I, what I do now when I was 14. And I don't really, I can, I can feel a continuity from what I did when I was 14 to now. And the, the things have manifested themselves in different ways, but the essence of my feelings about things and the things that interest me, my thoughts about things, they've expanded and whatever, but, but their roots to me are recognizable through everything. And I see much less difference between the different phases of what I've done than it may, than may seem apparent to other people. And maybe that would be clearer if there was this compendium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and thinking about how you work, I mean, you're. Um, I always think of you as as a, as a painter because that's what I'm, I'm most familiar with. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how you would describe yourself, but um, but but you know, you work in you, you do sculptural work, you do video work, your printmaking is fantastic. You do installation works and the wall drawings. The, the tradition for a catalogue resume is to divide those categories up. Mm -hmm. How problematic is that for an artist? Because I, I, when I think of your oeuvre, I, I, I think how interconnected all of those things are. That they're not, they're not separate. And you, some, I think you work on on various media simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And how, what's your sense of of splitting that up? I, I see what you mean. I, I think it's very, you know, I, I, I work at the moment, you know, in the last. 10, 15, 20 years, I work principally with um, uh, painting and printmaking and this, the sculpture there too, but the, two, but the painting and printmaking are very related. And, I, and there's things, I do things in prints that I can't do in, in uh, you know, I can't, what I can't do in one, I try to do in the other, but, but each one of them is feeding the other constantly. Um, there are direct, sometimes there are almost exact references to something I've made as a painting and a print, and sometimes there's not, as I can do things differently. But, but so there's lots of interconnections and the paintings, the paintings that I do came out of the installations. When I was doing the, inst the big installations, I wasn't doing the paintings. The paintings came after that and they came because I, need, I wanted to find a way that I could, when I did installations, uh, you got a week to do an installation, no matter how big. And that was both because of the turnover exhibitions, but also because of one's physical and mental capacity beyond a week and you were dead, you just, you physically couldn't do it. And so I wanted something I could spend more time with so, and painting. Became, so to, and it was, and I had to find a way of translating what I had been doing into painting. Um, so there were all those, those are connections that would be if the things are separated, you don't would necessarily see. But it would seem to me to be a heroic task to tie, <laughs> to tie, to tie, to tie them everything together. together. Um, and and I mean, how from an artist's perspective, how how do you kind of approach that thought that someone else will be picking this up? I mean, and it may be someone that you decide to appoint and, and start working with, as is the case with, with Rachel Whiteread and um, others, or, or that, that it's something that you know you know will happen afterwards. And how what's your sense of someone picking that up and 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 shaping it? Is that is that that something that concerns you? Or, or do you want to give us, do you feel as if you should be giving a sense of direction to that? It's a funny question. I, I kind of like the idea that somebody just did it themselves and didn't refer to me at all. Um, there's, some, there's something uh, that one uh, has to think about as an artist, which is that uh, you work on something very closely, you work it in the studio, it goes from the studio, if you're lucky, it goes to the gallery, if it goes to the gallery, it goes to somebody's house, somebody's place, somewhere. The minute it, oh, you're in control of it until it leaves the gallery, um, it's in very controlled circumstances in the studio because you control the studio. And then in the gallery, the galleries are nice and white walls and it's hanging in a perfect position and there's nothing interfering with it. And then it goes to somebody's house and you have no idea what happens after that. You have no idea what ghastly taste they have. 
you know, terrible wallpaper, they're awful furniture, they, they're dreadful children. You don't know, you don't, you don't know anything, you don't know anything about all of that. And there's something kind of, uh, that's also wonderful about that, that the thing has to go out, it has to, you know, it's the children leaving home, they have to go out and survive on their own, they have to look after themselves. And, and I'm always surprised, you know, when something now comes up in, in an auction, and I wonder where it's been. And sometimes I know, and sometimes it's been through other hands, I have no idea. And there's something, there's something amazing, really, about the way they live their own lives out there in the world. And that you become slightly disconnected. And I become, yeah. And yeah. to, be, and to oh, you know, I have a, a feeling for all the things that I've done, particularly when I see them after a long time. But I'm perfectly happy for them to be out there, and I don't want them. You know, once I've done something, I'm lost. I'm losing interest already. Of course. I'm onto the Which goes back to I'm that notion of the, you have to live the, the, the present. Now, yeah. I'm, the only work I'm really interested in is the exactly. one I'm working on. So not only you're not looking into the future, you're not looking at the past either. No, but I mean, there, there, is, there is one thing that I have to say, which is I was thinking about, about this. Uh, uh, Jasper Johns is a very interesting person in relation to this because... Uh, uh, Jasper made a lot of money very young. He was very successful, and he was also an artist who made money faster. He was known to have made more money than almost any other artist of his generation. But he sold out that Leo Castelli show. Yeah, yeah he did. It, 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 it was so successful. And what he did with the money was he bought back nearly all his own early work. So he holds his own holding of his own work is absolutely fantastic, which gives him an incredible legacy control because he actually does own so many key works. This is, I don't know of any other artists, there may be other artists who've done that, but I'm not aware of it, but that it's very particular with him. Almost from the very beginning, within five years of doing something and it being sold, he was buying it back. And uh, so obviously there will be a foundation, there will be a museum, there will be, a, but the things in it will be really fantastic things because they will be, because he is, he holds the best, he holds his own legacy in that sense. And Don Judd in Marfa is a fantastic legacy uh, proposition because there, you know, forever people will not only be able to see the best of what he did, but see it shown the way he meant it in the 20, late 20th century to be seen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's quite interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. It isn't just that there's certain works that need to be seen in a certain way. And certainly his work did, and he has provided that forever. And Ellsworth Kelly is a little bit like that as well. Yes. That there's a lot that there's a lot of holdings in the estate, and Ells Ellsworth was very particular about how his work was shown. And Jasper's fascinating. I did know that that he had a lot of his own work because we we borrowed it for an exhibition at the Academy. We borrowed a lot from him, um, and and it, that early success is kind of interesting when when we think about catalog resume when you have. You know, you talked about kind of finding your your really finding your flow when you got into your fifties. Jasper was kind of it, it's absolute opposite that he was he started really early, and then there were periods where he perceived to to dip slightly, and in, in certainly in terms of critical appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of that has been kind of reevaluated now, but you know, a catalog resume would 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 highlight that somehow, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? And mm -hmm. and should it, it should, should it should yeah. mask that? It should. Yeah, that should it, be it clear. Should, yes, I think that that become clear. I mean, you know, I mean, for most artists, there is a period of work which is seen as a kind of key period, and other things are seen in relation to those to that mm -hmm. key work um and uh, uh and, and you know that and that's that's often why uh there are artists, quite a few artists who have success young and they never really become more famous or what they do is never more successful than those things in the beginning because it's a zeitgeist thing they hit the moment they were just on the moment and they had the, the thing of youth and newness and oh, they were on the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, yeah, possibly don't have that that um, that sense of, of longevity. Um, I mean, another thing that was was mentioned in in this morning session is um, 
now given the, the technology of being able to do digital catalog resumes that we can put in a lot of archival material and documentation and oh, yeah. this ability to um to capture um a, a lot of recordings from artists about their bodies of work which is incredibly enriching for future scholars and curators i mean what, what what's your I, feeling on, on uh, that? that that's also very interesting and I, I mean it's it's why i think there's maybe this whole question of legacy has become a bigger issue because we record so much of everything 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 is so recorded now and i remember um uh, there was a, a young filmmaker that I knew. He was he had been a student of mine in, in the eighties, and he got interested in making kind of documentary films, which were mainly about artists and people in the art world. And we were both staggered that so many famous artists had almost never spoken on film in nineteen by the nineteen eighties. I mean, it just was unbelievable who hadn't been recorded, where there was no interview on tape anywhere and whereas now i mean there's hardly anybody who isn't you know isn't overwhelmed by being you know i mean i i'm i've done conversation like this this one will be recorded won't it and there will be people who will watch this online and a, and the, this is a kind of access that never has happened before and it, it does seem to me that we're a bit overburdened with information about all of the who is going to listen to all this i look i look at my own computer that i've been working on and i do because i do that all the drawings on the computer and for every drawing for every painting there's 20 30 40 versions of it before i come to the final one they're all on the recorder uh, recorded on the computer i have all the drawings i've done for the last 25 30 years there's tens of thousands of drawings who is going to open all these files and look at them yeah, but I mean, they, they, it's like a nightmare. Yeah, but it's very, that's exciting though, because they exist. I mean, it's, yeah, and they will. They exist, but I mean, you know, it's like, oh my God, it's bad enough with the phone, your own pictures on the phone. Who's going to ever look at those? Uh, but I mean, you know, but when you come to an art, you know, work and the way it saves everything and every, so, so there's the, the, whole, the it just seems to me that the, the relationship between but what is preserved and what isn't and what's in, that becomes more complicated when so much material mm -hmm. becomes available but i think that you know the, the the point that you make about you know since the 1980s everyone is recording everything and and you know when when we're kind of comparing um a, a van gogh catalog with a with a you know whoever pollock you no know, it's not a good example someone much more recent what you know th there's a huge difference because yeah. there's a huge difference in the material that we've got to play with, so that there, that there's you know absolutely, um, and and I don't know if that's difficult that there is this disparity between between the two types of of documentation, but it's also you know thinking of a, a, a an artist whose work I was kind of deep into recently was Milton Avery, and Milton Avery just did not he I think he uttered about three or four sentences in his lifetime about his work, so he's a kind of biographer's nightmare. But he um, incredibly prolific as an artist, and he felt, you know, why his famous quote was, "Why talk when you can paint?" <laughs> and so he's talking through his painting. So that allows future generations. When you're thinking of, there isn't one yet, but there will be, and a Milton Avery catalog, it will allow very free interpretation of his work. Mm. Whereas an artist who has given quite strong pronouncements on 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 various aspects of their work, it might be more difficult mm. for future curators to push against that i have to say that when i did my first exhibition uh i was asked by the gallery to write some notes to help them in mm -hmm. selling the work in the gallery and i did it and a, a very well-known art critic at the time saw the notes and he said that's a terrible mistake you should never have done that and you should never well i haven't shut up since really and uh, and, and if it was a mistake, I mean, I've compounded it uh, because uh, I found it impossible not to want to speak. But but I'm but I'm very I'm I'm very conscious in thinking about my own work and about other people's work. I always think that there's uh, there's two ideas in a work. One is the idea that I have it, but I'm going to make it. 
and I I don't just go in blindly and just faff around. I have a thought about what I'm trying to do in one way or another. I'm trying to do something, and that is my guiding idea. And then the work is finished, and it goes into the world, and it produces an idea. And that idea is not necessarily, in fact, unlikely to be exactly the same as the idea that I started with. And the second idea is more important than the first. And somebody who thinks they get close to the work by going to my idea, in my view, is wrong. That my idea was an initial, it's useful for me, it's the initiator for me, but it's not necessarily, even I look at my own work and see a difference in what I've done than what it was I thought I was doing. And I, so I think the second idea is actually the interpretive idea, the idea that is the, the response idea. Because they are, artworks are intended to generate ideas. They don't contain them, they generate ideas. And that's the, that's the important thing about them, not whether how true they are to the artist's original intention. Of that. That's what seems to me to be useful for the artist. It's, how one does it. So that, that kind of picks up on Rothko's quote when he said, you know, the, 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 the viewer completes the work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and presumably thinking of kind of legacy, the viewer looking at your work now will complete it in a different way to the viewer looking at your work in a hundred years time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, if you look at, at art history, very few artists in any century <laughs> get remembered and the thought that you might be one of them is a nice idea but i mean it's it's not one we can be confident in any way about or nor i think should one and but what's interesting it is interesting looking back that some of the people who were very highly thought of in their lifetime become much less so and people who were less thought, thought of bizarrely rise to the surface i mean in my in immediate terms i'm very aware that it's useful for me, I see it as useful for me in my career uh, to be visible. If I was became completely invisible, I think it is very difficult to sustain a, a sense that you're still alive, that you're still active as an artist. Um, uh, and I think you know, once an artist is dead and no longer there, there to be a presence, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's interesting what happens to the work about the work can, um, you know, um, the work can fade from view, but then again, you see what happens with artists that it gets re art gets rediscovered, doesn't it? It gets forgotten, and then somebody finds it a generation, two, three generations later, and it becomes, mm -hmm. and that. So again, legacy is very difficult. It, it's not, it's not a direct line in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. So some, you know, somebody could be seen as much more important later on yeah. than they were. Yeah, yeah. And it's also, you know, it's how how an artist is recontextualized in a, you know, in, in the future and how current their, how, what, what sort of currency their work has in that particular cultural climate. That's right, that's right. And, and none of us can predict that. You can't predict that. And the, yes, the, because the resonance of a certain kind of work may, may have a resonance in a future circumstance that we can't predict. Mm. But there's one thing for sure, that if, if there is a comprehensive catalog resume of an artist's work, it's more likely that um, they will yes. be looked at again in the future. Yeah. But, and, and also to be able to be seen in, sure. that, in that comprehensive way is, yeah. of course, obviously wonderful from an artist. Yeah. 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 But I, I just wanted to kind of just, just quickly go back to that notion of, you know, the, the, the person or the group that end up doing that, an artist catalogue resume and, and, and your thought that actually you'd stand back from that. It's, it's kind of similar to an artist becoming too involved in a, an exhibition of their work that's being curated. And it's the, it's the same sort of thing. And I, you know, we, we all know two sorts of artists and one are the, the ones that just want to be helpful, but will stand back and allow all of those kind of mm -hmm. uh, curatorial decisions to, to take place elsewhere. And then there's the one that wants to kind of roll up their sleeves and get involved and decide exactly how to do it. And, and it's interesting that, you know, I, I think possibly 
the catalogue resume is, is, is a little bit in the same, yes. in the same I, category. I found myself, uh, in my, certainly in my early work, I like to curate my own exhibitions 100%. I didn't want anybody's advice about everything. As I've gotten older, I'm actually quite thrilled when I go to an exhibition and somebody else has done it. And I will occasionally go around and change something. Uh, I just did this big exhibition in Korea, an enormous exhibition, and I I didn't know what to expect. And I got there and uh, all prepared to change things. And I went through and I didn't change a single thing. I thought they did done it, it really well. They, they did it really well. And I'm really happy that, that I wouldn't. They might have done a few things that I wouldn't have done, but then the things they did that I wouldn't have done were surprising and interesting to me. So I find, so, and in a sense that that's part of it is that it gives you a slightly different take on what you've done yourself. If somebody else introduces something simply by the way it's the way things are assembled. So do you think kind of, you know, on, on that theme that an artist it's difficult for an artist to really shape their legacy. I mean, you were talking about Donald Judd trying to shape his legacy. I mean, is it, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do, but um, I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to Marfa, but it, to go there is an unforgettable experience. And I think it will be an experience that people in 50, 100 years will just be crazy about. It'll be such an insight because it'll become so unusual, so surprising, and such a capsule of a certain time. Um, and uh, there, but but that's a very rare, that's a that, that's a very rare thing. I mean, I think there I, I assume that there will be a physical foundation for David Hockney, that there will be a there will be a museum. There will be like there is the Warhol Museum. There will be there will be, and there will be more of these today because mm -hmm. there's so because there are artists who've made a lot of money, and so there's there's money because it takes it's very expensive to set up a a foundation, and then it have it it needs an endowment really to keep going, and all of this is this is a very big thing to actually have a physical place that's physically run into the mm -hmm. into the future, um, uh, but. There's no doubt that does give an artist a certain kind of presence, lasting presence that um, uh, a catalog resume does not do, does not do. Uh, yeah, I've kind of got mixed feelings about museums well, dedicated to particular art. Yes, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure it's a great idea, yeah. but you can see yeah. that it, it it becomes a physical reference point. Yes. And, and if it uh, that, that there are way, there are people who travel great distances to go to to. Yeah. To visit such a place, like, like going to Martha. I mean, it is a destination. Yeah. And, we'll become, and I think we'll become increasingly so. But I think that the, the some, I mean, I, I've never been to Martha, but everyone raves about it and I will go. But I, I'm the other example I'm thinking of is Clifford Still in the Clifford Still Museum mm -hmm. and how that has taken um, that, that museum and the whole um, legacy that he set up for the care of his work has taken it out of free circulation and put it in into one place. And that's, I mean that that kind of it's the worry is that it sets that artist's work in aspects slightly mm -hmm. so that it's not it it isn't again I think it goes back to how much work is in circulation because True. I think if for artists who have a lot of work in circulation to have some place that is a focal point that's okay but if 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 the if the foundation kind of freezes all of the you know there's a, the, uh, you see it in London with Turner. There are too many Turners in London. There's not enough Turners in the rest of the world. You know, it's wonderful that they're all here. But on the other hand, you go to major museums around the world, and they're lucky if they have one. Yeah. Well, an artist of that importance, if there was a, if if he had not done what he did with the Tate, they would be much more distributed around the great museums of the world. Mm -hmm. And there is, this, uh, uh, you know, and you can gag on Turner, Turner frankly. In London, if you get yes, and he would have more influence as an international artist. He'd have he? much. He would have more influence if if there if there was that distribution. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you another question about legacy? And I I, I just wanted to to get your take on the idea of, of of legacy, not just being the work, but a kind of practice as well. 
And I'm thinking of artists like um, Joseph Albers. And I know that Joseph Albers was someone who was important to you because it, it, it mm -hmm. shaped your, your, your art education. But, you know, his legacy was not just his work, but was also his teaching mm -hmm. and, and was um, what he contributed to, um, to an understanding in, in theories of color. I mean, how important do you think that is? And do you think something like his practice in, in, in teaching and color theory has to be embedded somehow in, the, in his catalog resume? I mean, how do you fuse those things together? I, th I think with somebody like Albers, um, the, the, the closeness between his own practice and his teaching, it's, they're so closely integrated that it makes, it, it's hard to really think about one without mm -hmm. being aware of the other. And, but he seems very, he, that is quite ex exceptional, I think. I don't think there's many artists who have, who have that degree of, I mean, um, it, it, I, I think there's, there's many ways in which artists can be influential, and I, I mean, um, I, I am aware that I've taught a, a lot of people who have been, for, fortunately for them and for me, have been quite successful, and that's a nice legacy. I mean, very nice you know, it's a, you know, I'm very, legacy. very yeah. pleased with this as, uh, as, as a legacy, uh, and. Uh, but and I do see my own for myself. I see I do see my own teach into everything I do teaching when I've done some curating and my own artwork. I see it as all very as very much part of a of a very singular attitude of mm -hmm. Very that they are all these things are all connected. But I don't leave a very specific. I haven't left any kind of specific thing in the way that Albers did with the, his his uh, color theory and things like that. Um, but, um, but as I say, he is he is unusual in that sense. But I mean, when you taught, and I, I, I'm sure everyone knows that that Michael was a, a very celebrated teacher at Goldsmiths for a number of years and taught um, nearly all of the the YBA generation, and and there so much of their success was put down to to you kind of giving them a, a different way of of approaching life as an artist and and presumably that came that was born from your own experience yes well i i mean i i was very conscious that i was very lucky when i was a student and i wanted to uh, and that not everybody had the good luck that i did when i was a student and um but um i was also very to, to be honest, I thought I made a lot of mistakes when I was younger, and I thought I um, uh, had I had learned things that uh, were obvious, and so I did. Always when I was, it wasn't just with them. Always when I was teaching, I was trying to uh, help people have not make the same. You know, as you were, you know, like, like a good parent, you don't want your children to make the same mistakes as you do. Of course, they all, they they almost inevitably do, but that but still, it's good to have, I think, to have done that. I mean, um, uh, I got uh, you. I, I in a in a sense, I got a lot of credit for things done by a lot of people. It it was. Uh, journalistically, much easier to have one person to, to, <laughs> to focus on a lot. Uh, so I got I got congratulated for a lot of things about which I didn't have much I, to do. I think you're being modest. Mark. No, I don't have to be modest about it. I can tell you, but but um, uh, and presumably, um, because we, we we talked about this earlier, uh, when um, you had all of those very gifted students that you were steering in their twenties, none of them were thinking of documenting their works of future legacy. I mean, uh, uh, no, I never, and I I don't have good records at the beginning because it it I didn't really think about it very much. I mean, fortunately, um, I've had a consistency of galleries, so a lot of things have been recorded i mean um uh in general gallery in my experience of galleries have been they've been pretty good about recording what i do but of course I, i've done a lot of things that they haven't had that they haven't seen and that those things have not been recorded i also have you know hundreds of rather poor 
35 millimeter slides from the 60s, 70s, and the 80s before there was digital images and trying to transfer those into uh, pr digital prints when you know, they're not they're not wonderful and but and a lot of the record is yeah. of the early record is in images i took myself with not the best cameras and not, uh, because but we didn't take pictures in the way you know you take pictures constantly now and I, in those days it was an effort. Yeah, it was, it was a, an yeah, effort. Was you, had to, you had to go and have it processed, and then they got they lost film. And, you know. So um, just one last question before we open this up to the floor. Um, I just wanted to ask you, are there any catalogue resumes which you regularly refer to? And are there any catalogue resumes that you, of artists who you have known, um, and and that it it's it's the catalog resume have brought you revelations about their work that you you kind of weren't aware of during their lifetime. I would have to say no. I'm I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint no, you. Either. No, but, but I, I'm 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 an, I'm aware of people having catalog resumes, and I have occasionally looked up something uh -huh. in one, but. But I don't. I don't go pursuing other artists' work. Uh, the only one that really interests me is me, and I don't have a catalog. <laughs> res I don't have a catalog resume. So, <laughs> um, I, I mean, uh, I think it's. The, the, I. I. My assumption is that uh, catalog resumes have a, a much more to do with. Uh, uh, people involved in hi hi historians and critics, and they are also to do with the future rather than the present. Mm -hmm. And that it's trying to keep trying to make a record while you can make a record, and that that record is what will become important. But it'll become it'll become increasingly important in the future. I mean, I, I'm very aware because of that thing on television, Fake and Fortune, um, which is very entertaining. And uh, about how the 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 uh, catalog resume um, foundations, which judge whether a work is real or not, and how severe they can be about that, and how important that can be. But you have to be a very important artist in history for that to be such a critical issue about things. I mean, uh, in certain ways, I think my own work is extremely easy to to. Um, you know, to fake, but at the same time, physically to make it is much more difficult than it looks. And so I'm, I feel slightly protected by that. But um, uh, but I think, I, and that's certainly an issue where the question of a catalog resume and whether a work is in that catalog or not becomes obviously absolutely crucial for people in buying and selling work. And about you know what is recorded as being true truly by the artist, um, and in that that seems to me a very important function mm -hmm. in for a catalog mm -hmm. resume mm -hmm. because it matters so much for somebody to have a work which is not in it and then is not accepted as being potentially in it. Sure, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, I think we've got a few moments for any questions from the floor. If anyone wants to. Ask a question, raise your hand. There's someone at the back with a the microphone. There's no questions. We've answered everything. Ask, yeah. <laughs> um, since you don't have a catalogue resume in the works, uh, and as you say, the actual physical making of the work is the most uh, tangible thing uh, that you will pass on in the future. Um, do you have a special way of keeping your colors uh, and your materials catalogued or at least recorded? Or I'm, I'm not saying don't, don't don't share your state secrets, but no. are they safe? Are your cards <laughs> safe? Well, uh, as you may know, I, my work does depend on using a certain kind of tape, um, which has the miracle quality of being able to curve and if it hadn't been for the tape I couldn't have done any of my work 
and um, and I often say that um, if the company stopped making it, I'd have to buy the company because without the tape, I wouldn't have any work at all. And so I and I keep thousands of rolls in reserve just in case. Um, but uh, the, the the it's. Uh, from uh, there are things that get damaged and things like that where uh, conservators need records uh, about and something there was a painting of mine recently that got, was very severely damaged uh, I wasn't even positive that it could be recovered and through the 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 the, the person who was doing the conservator was very good and was pursuing me about certain things and then it reminded me about there was a specific color that i found that i had made through a specific company and he pursued it back to them and they remade exactly the color that i had ordered because they had the record of it and he then he repainted the picture and i've seen it he sent me photographs of it and I was absolutely stunned by because it looked like it did, like it was new. It was a fantastic restoration, but it was because you could trace. He was able to trace absolutely specifically, and the company was prepared. And and I think com the people who I, I deal with certain very few people in, in the fabrication of paint, and they take a lot of interest in how it lasts and in how it's maintained and. Uh, any problems with it, you can always go to them. And so, I, and this, people, there are people who know this. I do sometimes, you know, I had a, a, an assistant who worked for me for over 20 years, and we used to joke that I could die and he could go on making things for about five, <laughs> if he didn't tell anybody. <laughs> like he could have gone on for a few years without, without me being there. Any other questions? Or without operating fields. That's the answer. And with that, there must be some portion of that. Yeah, but there's things that you can't. I mean, I did, before I made images of things, I used real objects. And even with, I note from images of things, objects that you think are very stable are changing all the time. And if you go back five or 10 years to get a, a pencil that you could bought, uh, nobody make a pencil that's exactly the same as you had. It, they, they look, you would think they're the same until you go to put them together and they're not. And everything that we are producing is constantly changing. And, and of course, many of the things that I draw will become uh, just mysteries to people. In maybe 10, 20 years, I, I know the, the more technological the objects I'm, I'm using, the more dated they will become, the more quickly and the more they will become. The research will be what it would be the question, what is it? <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Michael. It just remains for me to just say what a you know, fascinating conversation this has been that you've given us such an insight into your your perception of, of legacy as an artist. And that's been really interesting. I'm sure we've all enjoyed it very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.